wireless LANs. So now we're going to spend several lectures going into detail of how wireless LANs work. And in fact, for the rest of the semester, we're going to look into detail at five or six different technologies, starting with wireless LANs. The first few lectures were just very broad coverage. And we will, during this topic, we will uh, explain some of the technology of wireless LANs, but also demonstrate some, some during the lecture using some devices. And next week, and in your assignment, we will, you will do some tests and experiments with wireless LANs and write some reports about it. So the aim in this topic is for you to understand how 802.11 wireless LANs work and understand what impacts upon the performance of wireless LANs. We care about performance always, performance in terms of how fast we can send, sometimes performance in terms of how much delay is involved in sending data, and also those other factors of distance, uh, cost, um, frequency and so on, how they impact upon how we can use a wireless LAN. We're going to look at first and mostly today is the, the basic architecture of 802.11, explain what is 802.11 and how it's separated into different layers and look briefly at the, the characteristics of the physical layer and then we'll go into detail of how the medium access control protocol works. One, and there's two main parts of medium access control. Managing the network, doing things like when I turn on my laptop, I need to connect to the wireless LAN. How does that happen? That's the management features. And then once I connect to the wireless LAN, I want to access some web page. How do I send my data across the wireless link? and we'll see that we use a, a mechanism called the distributed coordination function. And we'll go through some in depth how that works. We won't talk so much about security. Uh, we may mention some things as we go, but we won't go into any depth about how the security mechanisms work. First, let's introduce some concepts, uh, an, a, a quick overview and some terminology. A very quick introduction. This diagram illustrates that we have different entities involved in a typical wireless LAN. It may be different from this, but a typical one that we use is that we have a mobile device, a laptop, a mobile phone, which we refer to as our client, a wireless LAN client. And that connects wirelessly to usually a fixed device, a wireless LAN access point. So this blue line here, this zigzag line is showing a wireless link. This is our wireless link. And our access point typically then connects via wired links to some other network. Say an Ethernet network, where this is an Ethernet switch. These are just some desktop computers connected to that switch via Ethernet, wired links. Maybe some router and a router off to the internet. And then we have the rest of our network. So the wireless part is just here, between the client and the access point. And that's what we focus on when we, talk about, when we go into the details of the data transfer, this part. But of course, in practice, we want to access not just something, we want to get information not just from the access point, but from other computers in the internet. So we have a wired connection, uh, usually, in this part. So, a client needs some wireless trans... Uh, uh, the client device. Now, this is an external one. Of course, laptops, mobile phones have this built in, basically. The transmitter and re receiver and antenna is built into a laptop. This is an external one. And an access point like this, similar, but just some hardware that has similar wireless transmitter and receiver, has some antennas, and maybe has some software to do a few extra things for managing the clients that attach. You see these 
If you look in the corridor when you're walking around, you'll see them on the walls that provide that wireless LAN access in SIT. IEEE 802.11 is the name. IEEE, we know, is an organization that creates standards. 802.11 is the, the number of a specific standard. The 802 series covers lands and, and metropolitan area networks. Dot 11 is the wireless LAN part. So 802.11 is the standard for specifying how to communicate from the client to the access point. To communicate from the access points to these other hosts and out to the internet is not defined within this standard. It's not within the scope. That's part of Ethernet, IP, ADSL and all those other technologies which we know about already. So it's just about this part of communications. So therefore it's really about link level communications. We create a link from client to access point so we can transfer our data. If we think of our five layer internet stack we're focusing on the physical layer layer one, how to transmit bits as signals, and the data link layer, how to make sure that those bits are delivered efficiently between the source and destination, <coughs> or just across a single link. Really. So if we summarize the, the main characteristics of wireless LANs, how fast can we send? We're talking about tens of megabits per second and nowadays hundreds of megabits per second as a data rate. So, in fact, my slides are a bit old. I haven't changed them for the last two years. So, some of the numbers here, are, uh, and, well, 54 megabits per second is typical. 11 megabits per second is no longer typical. That is, it, it would be hard to buy a device or find a device that supports only 11 megabits per second. And there are some faster data rates. 11N provides uh, 100, 150, 300 megabits per second. But probably the most common one that you'll find in use today is the support of 54 megabits per second by the access points and clients. And that's the data rate. The speed at which we send bits across the link at the, data, the, link, the link layer level. But the throughput because of overheads is about half of that and even less than half. It's not fixed. It depends on different conditions. So we're talking about 5 to maybe 25 megabits per second or even higher if we use 11N we can get higher but much less than the th data rate the throughput is. And even worse it's shared. That is if everyone connects from their mobile device right now to a single access point, the data rate may be 54 megabits per second, the network throughput may be 25 megabits per second, you may only get 500 kilobits per second because you must share that amongst all the other users. So the individual throughput can be much, much lower than what this number is. We'll explain how that, or why that's the case and do some calculations during this topic. We care about how fast, how far we can transmit. We're talking about tens of meters inside, hundreds of meters outside in typical configurations. The signals pass through walls but they are impeded. That is, the sig there's significant power loss as the signal passes through a wall. So it will not go through many walls. How much, what's the transmit power being used? Ranging with typically uh, the order of milliwatts to up to around 100 milliwatts, the typical configuration. Some devices, uh, higher power and maybe 200 milliwatts, even up to one watt. But most devices are in uh, up to 100 milliwatts. That's the transmit power. The higher the transmit power, the larger the distance, but the more energy we consume and particularly important in mobile devices. The most common frequency channel or frequency band used is the 2.4 gigahertz unlicensed 
part of the spectrum. There's another one, 5 gigahertz, but that's much less common uh, in terms of the usage. Okay, thank you. So 2.4 gigahertz is the main frequency band used for wireless LANs. Are they secure? There are mechanisms that provide satisfactory link level security. WPA is the, uh, the acronym for one of those uh, mechanisms. So yes, can be provide sufficient security for most applications if they're used correctly, if the security mechanism are used correctly. So we're going to go through the details of the technology and come back to some of these characteristics uh, through this topic. So, summarise some of the terminology we have. We have clients, your laptop, your mobile phone can be a client. We have access points. The access points we think of connect the wireless LAN to some other network, a wired LAN usually. So we see the access point is connecting the wireless part to the wired part. The clients are the end user devices. And the clients associate with an access point, with one access point at a time. So we have this procedure uh, called association. That says that it's going to use that access point to deliver the data onto the network. We may have multiple clients associated with one access point. The set of clients that are associated with an access point is called a basic service set. BSS, or a cell in some cases, but as a more <coughs> informal terminology. Because similar in cell phone networks, mobile phone networks, we have a base station and the phones within range of that, or the, the transmission range of that base station creates some cell. But the formal terminology is a basic service set. And those access points may connect onto a wired network and we have, may have multiple access points connecting into a same wired network. This is a, a, a switch where the both access points are connected via cables to that switch, an Ethernet switch, which then connects off to another switch and some PCs in this example network. There are other configurations but this is the most common. So since we may have multiple access points in connected to some switched LAN, the set of all clients and all access points within the network is called an extended service set. Single access point and its clients, a basic service set. All of the access points and their clients in some uh, connected together, usually managed by one organisation, referred to as an extended service set. And a client can move between access points. The clients, of course, may be mobile. You have your laptop or your mobile phone as you walk. You may be associated to one access point. As you move away, you may disassociate with that access point and connect to a new one because you've got better connection to that new one. Closer uh, distance and therefore a better uh, connection and higher data, data rate, for example. This process of changing between access points is referred to as a handover. You hand over from one to another. There are some challenges with performing a handover. We will look at the, in wireless LAN, we won't look at any of the details of those challenges, but we will look at in a next topic on mobile networking some of those challenges in de depth. But we can move around and therefore we may change access points. That's the basics of the terminology that, that we have. When I talk about the clients, it can be any device that has the wireless LAN uh, hardware 
and the associated software to run that hardware built into it. Typical mobile phone or a laptop, but can be other devices as well. The 802 architecture covers standards for different LAN and metropolitan area network technologies. Our five layer internet stack from physical layer up to application layer, IEEE 802 covers technologies mainly at the, well, at the physical layer and the data link layer. Transmitting bits as signals and making sure those bits are delivered efficiently across a link, the data link, and doing extra things like addressing and setting up the link. So that's the focus of all the 802 standards, including Ethernet standards, the Ethernet family, 802.3 and its extensions, token ring, uh, a LAN, older LAN standard, 802.5, wireless LANs, 802.11, WiMAX, we mentioned yesterday, 802.16 for wide area links and others. There was .22, there's more than .22 now, that cover wired and wireless technologies for local and in some, in some cases also wide area network links. Bluetooth, ZigBee, mesh networks all fit within some of these other standards. We're focusing on 802.11. All of these have a physical layer and a MAC layer, medium access control layer, that may be specific to that technology. But they all share a logical link control layer, 802.2. This is for addressing, assigning addresses to devices, and in some cases for setting up the link. But some of these standards don't use this to set up the link. They just use the addressing part of it. The MAC layer, what does medium access control protocol do? What's a MAC protocol do? What do you think a MAC protocol, medium access control, what's the basic explanation or definition of a MAC protocol? Anyone? How to share the medium. Good. To share medium access control. Think of the words. To control who can access the medium. The medium is the, when we're talking about wireless LAN, the, the, the air effectively. We have a wireless medium. We need to control who transmits at what time. Who can access the medium at a particular time. Because it's a shared medium, we need some mechanisms to make sure that two people don't transmit at the same time and cause some interference. So each of the standards have some medium access control protocol. Some of them are simple, some are very complex, and they are maybe different between the standards and a physical layer protocol. Because they use different mediums, some use copper, some optical, some wireless, they have different physical layer standards. We're focusing on the 802.11 MAC and the 802.11 physical layer. We'll go through the characteristics of the physical layer and then we'll spend some depth or, or some time going through the MAC layer in depth. Within the 802.11 block from the previous diagram, there are some different extensions to the original 802.11 standard. It's been developed over time and it's been improved and new features have been added. There are in fact multiple physical layer standards. So if we look at these in detail, we could visualize it like this, where we have the original 802.11 physical layer and that was improved over time and the improvements were documented in a different standard and they were extended by a letter 802.11a and b so they improved upon the original one so a different physical layer using different uh, modulation techniques providing different data rates in some cases 
And in fact, they've been improved over time. We get 11G as a physical layer and 11N as a physical layer, which is common in new devices today. So there are different physical layers that can be used. But they all use the same MAC protocol. That hasn't changed so much. There's been some extensions to the MAC protocol which provide different features, but the basics are still the same over the 15 or 20 years that these have been improved. The MAC basics have stayed the same. They're common amongst the physical lab. And there are some others. So where's C, uh, D, E, and so on? Well, there are some other enhancements, some additional features that are also standardized to do different things, like security. To provide extra security, there's 802.11i. Quality of service, to make sure that one person gets better service than someone else, 802.11e. To manage the frequencies that are used. Let's say a nice thing to do is that we'll see that you can use multiple frequencies. You can select between 13 different frequencies. A nice thing would be to automatically select a frequency that no one else is using to manage which frequency to use or manage the spectrum. So there's some standards for how to do that. They are fit within this, the optional enhancements. That is, you don't have to implement them or use them. Only the later devices use all of those options. We're not going to talk much about the options, just on the basics of the physical layer and then the Mac. So let's look at the characteristics of the physical layer. Remember, in a simple definition, we are determining how to send bits as some physical signal, in this case radio waves. We've got bits as an input, the physical layer transmits some signal to represent those bits. The receiver receives the signal and decodes them to get the bits back again. So the physical layer standards define how to shape that signal, the modulation techniques used, to make sure it's efficient, because we can only transmit in a certain portion of the spectrum. We want to transmit as much data, as many bits as possible, but make use, of, well, we've got a limited amount of uh, bandwidth to make use of. Specifies what frequencies can be used and what bandwidth is, is the signal and some timing so that the sender and receiver can synchronize with each other so that the receiver knows when the first bit or when, which part of the signal represents one bit and which part represents the next bit, the synchronization between those bits. We're not going to spend any detail explaining how they work. It takes a lot of effort and it's something that we don't have enough background to cover in this course. It's something maybe the uh, uh, in telecommunications and so on you may cover because we haven't covered the modulation techniques and so on in detail in the previous course. But we'll mention just the main characteristics. The things we care about really if we hide some of the details are the data rate, how fast we can send in bits per second, the range, how many meters can we transmit our signal? It depends on two different factors. It depends on how much power we transmit with and how good our receiver is at receiving the signal and understanding the signal, the sensitivity of the receiver. What frequency we can use and what bandwidth do we use for transmissions? And related to that, how many different channels can we use? So we'll look at these characteristics for the different technologies available. This table summarizes some of those characteristics for the different physical layers that have been developed over time. Originally, the 802.11 standard was released in 1997. So that's what, 15 years ago, 14, 15 years ago. 
the original standard used a frequency band of 2.4 gigahertz. When I say 2.4 gigahertz, it uses a range of frequencies in around 2.4 gigahertz. That is plus or minus uh, several, well, I think it's plus or minus 100 megahertz. We'll see a diagram that shows that shortly. The modulation technique was DSSS, direct sequence spread spectrum. That was the way at which the, uh, the signal was shaped or the modulation was used. There were three non-overlapping channels available to be used. That is that I could choose one of multiple channels, so in fact 11 or 13 channels depending on what country you're in, but only some of those channels were separated by enough spacing such that they didn't interfere with each other. So we say they're non-overlapping. In the, the benefit for non-overlapping channels is that if we have two channels non-overlapping, then two people can transmit at the same time and not interfere with each other, effectively giving us higher, uh, higher throughput for the system. So the more non-overlapping channels, the better for the end user performance, potentially. We'll come back to the channels in a moment with a diagram, but let's go through the other characteristics. The data rate, the initial data rate max, was a maximum of 2 megabits per second. And in all of these, this is the maximum. That is, you could select, or the device could select between different values. The maximum it could go up to was 2. And the range was between 20 and 300 meters, approximately. The range depends on many different factors. It depends upon the transmit power of the device, and the transmit power was not standardized. There were some limits, but you could use different transmit powers. It depends upon the environment. Are you inside or outside? Uh, and therefore, there's no exact number for the range. But typically, indoor, tens of meters, outdoor, hundreds of meters. As this was developed even before it was released, they realized that the data rate was going to be too slow for future applications and therefore started to create some improvements. And they created, the people creating the standard created two improvements at the same time, 11B and 11A. They were released at the same time, A and B, 1999. But 11B was designed to be backwards compatible with the original 802.11 use the same frequency band, the same modulation technique, but provided a higher data rate by using some different encoding, some better techniques, up to 11 megabits per second. 802.11a was developed in parallel, but to get a higher data rate, <coughs> used a different frequency, which meant you could not have an 802.11a access point that the old 802.11 devices could connect to. You could install an 802.11b access point and the old laptops that used 802.11, the original one, could connect to that new access point, as could the new laptops or devices that used 11b. They used the same technologies. You could not do that with 11a. And that's one of the reasons, plus the extra complexity of 11a at that point, that 11B became more popular, and most people used that, even though it had a lower data rate, a lower maximum data rate. 11A had more channels because it used a different frequency band. There was a wider bandwidth available, and you could transmit on more non-overlapping channels, so that was a good thing. It had a lower range because of the frequency uh, had a lower range, and that was a negative thing. In 2003, 11G was released. It was an extension or an improvement, really, of 11B. Again, backwards compatible. If you spent all your money to build an 11B network in your organization, you could go and buy an 11G access point and replace 
your 11B access points gradually and all your old 11B clients could still connect. And that's a, an important factor for upgrading technologies because the organisation that upgrades doesn't have to upgrade all the devices, they only need to upgrade the access points. They can gradually update, upgrade the clients as people get a new computer and so on. So 11G was released, maximum data rate of 54 megabits per second. Range was generally lower than the 11B. And now we have 11N. And 11N supports, I think, both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Uh, my table here, as I said, these slides need some updating. Maximum data rate of 300 megabits per second, only under certain conditions. Similar range. Uses some different modulation techniques. Multiple input, multiple output. MIMO. It uses multiple antennas for transmit and receive. Or it potentially can use multiple antennas. So you can think it's sending t two copies of the same signal. And that can help with performance. So as technologies have improved over time, the standards have been updated or extensions have been developed. From our perspective, giving us higher data rates, changing the distance or the range hasn't improved or hasn't got larger. It's still around the tens of metres. Now technologies can make use of both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz ranges. You can buy an access point that supports both frequency bands. So that's a, a brief coverage of the characteristics of the physical layer technologies. There's a couple more slides on this and then we'll come back to these no, non-overlapping channels. An example first, let's look at my laptop and see what characteristics it has in terms of the wireless LAN. Uh, I've got two wireless LAN devices in my laptop. There's a built-in one. Most laptops have a built-in wireless LAN card which acts as the client and I've plugged in a USB one as well. We can look at the configuration of our wireless LAN on my computer with IW config. You know IF? No, do you know it? You may have seen IF config last semester. In the lab next week, you'll see IF config in use. It just lists my wireless interfaces. My Ethernet interface is not a wireless interface. It's a wired one. It has no wireless capabilities, nor is my loopback. I've got two wireless interfaces, WLAN 0 and WLAN 1. WLAN 0 is my built-in to the laptop interface. It supports 802.11b and g. So the two physical layer technologies are supported. My external one, the USB wireless LAN device, supports b, g and n. So it's a newer device and it supports the later physical layer technology. It also gives us some other information, some of it we may recognise, the frequency that it's used and so 2.437 gigahertz, that represents a specific channel in the set of channels that are available. We said that a client associates with an access point. When you want to connect and send data via an access point, you need to first associate with that access point. Currently, my both of my wireless interfaces are not associated with any access point. If I associate with one access point, if I can remember, if I tell Wireless LAN 0 to associate with an access point, remember our terminology, a single access point and its clients is referred to a basic server set the set of access points run by one organisation is referred to an extended server set. So I'm going to tell 
if I have a strong enough signal to access the extended server set with the ID and this is what you'll see or refer to as a network name WSIT. I want my wireless LAN built into the laptop to associate with an access point connected to the extended server set identified by WSIT. That's the name. I need to be an administrator to do that. No errors. Let's see now from our IW config if <coughs> that worked. Now we see from my wireless LAN 0 interface I'm associated with some access point. The ID of the extended server set is WSIT, that's the SIT wireless network. Uh, this is some identifier of the access point. It's a 48-bit bit IEEE address represented as a 12, 12 hexadecimal digits. The same as your LAN card uses, the same format address. That's the address of the access point. I'm using this frequency, 2.437 gigahertz. The mode manage means the mode of connecting to an access point. The access point is managing clients. Some other information, the bit rate, the data rate for the connection is one megabit per second. It can go faster than that, but I think until I transmit some data, it will sit at one megabits per second. The transmit power that my client is using is 20 dBm. How many milliwatts? Remember, we can express power levels in decibels and that corresponds to some absolute value in watts or milliwatts. Who can remember? 10, 10 log, 10 log the, the power level. So. In general, the dB value is 10 log in base 10 of the power value. If, if our power is measured in milliwatts, we get dBm. So the dB, dBm is de decibels relative to one milliwatt. The M here refers to milliwatt. It just doesn't show the W. of the power measured in milliwatts. So I have 20 dBm equals 10 log in base 10 of some power in milliwatts. 20 divided by 10 is 2. 2 equals log base 10 of P. What's P? High school mathematics, what's P? Twenty equals ten log p, log base ten. One hundred. That is ten to the power of two is one hundred. So p in milliwatts is one hundred milliwatts. That is the log of one hundred is two. So 20 dBm is 100 milliwatts. That's my transmit power of the wireless device. And that's norm for most devices, not all, but most, that's the normal transmit power or the maximum transmit power that they use. The other things are characteristics of the wireless LAN. Some we will have to, once we go through the Mac, we'll explain what they are, these ones. Link quality, some, some measure of how good the link is between my client and the access point. Where is the access point? It's somewhere out in the corridor, I, would, I guess. I don't know which access point I've associated with. Note that well, I don't know which one this is, identified by this address. The extended service set of WSIT refers to the network of access points 
within SIT. So when I specified to connect to WSIT, I didn't specify a specific access point. I said any access point within this extended server set. And hopefully it chooses the, the closest or the, the access point with the best link. Some measure of link quality, 19 out of 70. Some measure of the received signal level. We receive a signal from the access point. How strong is the received signal? minus 91 dBm and some statistics of the packets that have been sent and received with errors. I run that, I look at it now so that uh, something has happened on my computer, I've transferred some data and my computer does things in the background. Same characteristics, same access point, the data rate now is 36 megabits per second. So it automatically switches between different data rates with the aim of use, using the highest data rate possible that gives a strong enough signal. It turns out the higher the data rate that you use, you need a stronger signal to be able to understand what is transmitted. Or in other words, uh, you can use the highest data rates over a short range. Uh, you can use the lowest data rates over a much longer range. Same transmit power. That doesn't change or hasn't changed. The link quality has changed. That may vary over time. The signal level has changed. Uh, and that's about all we can see from this information. So that's an example of... Uh, the, some of the physical layer characteristics for my wireless device. Any questions before we move on? Mm -hmm. um, yes, so in SIT you know there are multiple access points they're all part of the one network or the one extended server set named WSIT with the idea that you can connect you specify WSIT and it will connect to the hopefully the best access point. But uh, why are you at that Didn't you connect to the strongest signal access point? So some way the, the client needs to work out which one is the best access point. So how do you do that? Not only measured by signal strength. So what we'll see is that I, my laptop can in fact be in range of multiple access points. Yeah. Some may have different signal strengths yeah. from my, my perspective. Uh, uh, I think another access point is On your device? Yes, <coughs> my, my device is here. So the question is, how, how does my laptop choose one of those access points to connect to? There may be three access points within range of my laptop. It needs to choose one of them con to connect to. And that depends upon the implementation of your device. It's not part of the standard to choose that. But some ways, choose the one with the best signal strength. That's one obvious way. But you may use some... Uh, not the best signal strength at a, one point in time, but maybe the best signal strength of several messages that have been received over the past several, well, the past second, for example. And is it necessary that different access points have to use different channels? No. Uh, will we look at channels shortly? Same, same SSID. Uh, In theory, you can use any channel, that you, or any of the available channels. So th the first thing is, how does my client choose the access point? We can do it based on signal strength. But how does my client know the signal strength? Well, we'll see that the access point sends some packets. When I receive a packet, I measure the signal strength. Maybe one approach is, OK, I just received three packets from each of the access points. Look at the best of those three signal strengths measured choose that access point. But 
if someone walks between my client and the access point, the signal strength may change because I am blocking the signal. So it may change over time and it will change over time. So somehow, right now, access point one may be the best access point. One second later, access point two may be the best access point. The question then is, do we swap between them or do we maintain the old access point? If we keep looking and we'll see some other, if you look at the link quality, it's at 22, 15, 24, sorry, 18, just the link quality here. If I just keep looking, it's changing over time. So the link quality changes or varies over time due to the environment. So we need to be able to choose the best access point but not change between them too often. The question about the channels, we'll go through that when we look at the, the channels available in a moment. Let's just go back to our slides and see what we have remaining on the physical layer. That was a summary of the characteristics. Let's look at or make some assumptions about how the physical layer works in terms of transmitting signals. We are using broadcast radio or a point to multi point transmission, it's wireless. We have omnidirectional antennas, not highly directional, so we don't consider it as point to point. The normal operation is that we have a transmitter, it transmits in all directions, it transmits a signal with equal strength in all directions. Therefore, anyone within, this, within distance or within range of that in any direction should be able to receive the signal. We've said that the frequency bands used are either 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. The most common is 2.4. Both of them are unlicensed spectrum in most parts of the world. In some, some countries have different rules for which frequency bands are allocated for different purposes. In most countries, 2.4 gigahertz is unlicensed. In some countries, there are different parts of the 5 gigahertz band which are already used by different technologies and therefore cannot be used by wireless LAN. As they're unlicensed, we don't have to pay to use them. But because we don't have to pay, there may be many people using it. And to be fair amongst all the users, we need to follow some rules in using that. One of the rules normally is that you cannot transmit above some maximum transmit power. I think in the original 802.11 standard, they said the maximum transmit power was 100 milliwatts. I don't know if it's been updated, but now you can buy devices that transmit at a higher power level than 100 milliwatts. This one transmits. I can't remember if it was 500, it doesn't say. 500 milliwatts or even 1,000 milliwatts. So you can transmit at a higher power level. And because it's unlicensed, other technologies, not just wireless LAN, can use this uh, frequency band. And we can interfere between the devices using the same technology as well as other technologies. What are some other technologies that use 2.4 gigahertz? Quiz question. Name one other technology that uses 2.4 gigahertz. Another, so not, not wireless LAN, something else that uses 2. Point. Bluetooth. Bluetooth does. Anything else? S some cordless telephones use it. Not mobile phones, but the cordless ones that you can have at home. Anything else? Who cooks food at home in a microwave? Microwave ovens use 2.4 gigahertz. So not just communication devices, microwave ovens use the same frequency. So put your laptop in a microwave oven and turn it on and you won't be able to transmit. Test it. No, they use the same frequency and potentially can interfere with each other. So other devices can use the same frequency 
and we need to deal with that somehow. Let's make some assumptions about how the physical transmissions work to simplify things in our later discussions. These assumptions in most cases hold true uh, or help us in, in discussing the, the characteristics we're interested in. We'll say that a radio device's transmission can be received by all other devices within some transmission range. What is the transmission range? Well, in real life it varies. It depends upon the signal strength I transmit with, the capabilities of the receiver, and the environment, that is, the interference in there. But if we can approximate and say, OK, the approximate transmission range is 30 metres, uh, plus or minus uh, several metres, but if we say the transmission range is 30 metres, then to simplify things, we'll say that all nodes within 30 metres of the transmitter will receive the transmission. Any nodes more than 30 metres away from the transmitter cannot successfully understand or receive the transmission. When we say a transmission range, that's what we mean. Anything within range can receive, outside of range cannot. It's not that simple in practice because the range varies. And we'll assume that the range or the transmission goes in all directions. Typical antenna is an omnidirectional antenna, which is the same in all directions on a horizontal plane, but maybe weaker up and down, more like a donut around the, the transmitter. But let's keep things simple, even, even simpler, and say it's an isotropic antenna. Uh, that same up, same down, same in each directions around, just for simplicity for considering our transmitter. A radio device cannot transmit and receive at the same time, the way that they implemented, because of the interference. If I try to transmit and receive at the same time, when I transmit, that signal is received by my receiver. And that signal is very strong. So if someone else tries to transmit to me, if I'm transmitting and receiving at the same time, then I will not receive what the other person transmits, I'll receive what I just transmitted. Or at least what I transmit will interfere with what the other person transmits. So mo most, if not all, wireless devices are built or implemented such that they either transmit or receive. So we'll assume that that's the case. If we have one wireless device, we can either transmit or receive. As a result, we have half duplex transmit or half duplex operation. We're sending or we're receiving. Most wired networks, such as Ethernet, have full duplex. I connect a cable to my laptop to the switch. I can transmit on some wires and receive on other wires at the same time. There's a big difference in terms of performance. We'll assume half duplex. We'll assume that. A device cannot successfully receive transmissions if two or more sources transmit at the same time. So, or from two or more sources. That is, if I'm the receiver, if two other devices transmit at the same time and I am within range of those transmitters, we'll assume that I cannot successfully receive either of them. That is, those two will transmit they'll interfere at my receiver and my receiver will not be able to decode and work out what was transmitted. That's common, but it's not always the case. Some cases, or in practice, if a strong transmitter transmits and a very weak transmitter transmits, sometimes my receiver can understand the strong one but not the, the, the weak one. But we'll assume if two or more transmit at the same time, if I'm within range, I cannot receive either of them. 
the two transmissions interfere with each other. Because we will look more at the transmission of packets or frames, not just bits or signals, when we transmit a packet or two sources transmit packets at the same time and they're within the range of my receiver, we think that those packets collide with each other. If they're transmitted at the same time, from my receiver's perspective, there's a collision of the packets. So we have this concept of collisions because two transmit at the same time. So we're going to use those assumptions in looking at how the rest of the 802.11 wireless LAN works. Let's look at one more thing before we go back, uh, before we go on to the MAC protocol. Let's go back and look at channels and explain a little bit about channels. Uh, we have it on the website. There's a link. I hope. Uh, I have a picture. I have a picture, and I think it was originally taken from Wikipedia of the channels for wireless LAN. And here it is. So this is a diagram that shows the, the frequency channels available for a typical wireless LAN device. It varies in some countries. So some countries have a particular bandwidth available for wireless LAN and other countries have something different available, but it's all similar to this. What we see here is the spectrum. So this is the 2.4 gigahertz band. So at this point, the frequency is 2.412 gigahertz. Up to here we have 2.484 gigahertz. These values 1 up to 13, ignore 15, 14 for, for now, 13 is common, are the center frequencies of the different channels available. So we have a 13 channels available, yeah. ignoring this 14, 13 channels available. Each channel has a center frequency as listed here, 2.412 gigahertz up to 2.472 and transmits a signal with a bandwidth of approximately 22 megahertz. So our signal is not just one frequency component, but a, a, a range of frequency components. So shown here for channel 6, we're actually transmitting a signal from this frequency up to this frequency. And let's calculate or draw that. If we consider channel channel 1, if the center frequency is 2412 megahertz, channel 1, a bandwidth of 22 megahertz means it's actually 2412 plus or minus 11 megahertz is the range, is the spectrum. So going from 
the minimum frequency of 2401 megahertz up to the maximum of 2423 megahertz. That is simply 2412 plus or minus 11 megahertz. 11 because the bandwidth, this is the center, we have 11 to the left and 11 to the right. So the range is 2401 up to 2423 megahertz. That's for channel 1. So when we transmit on channel 1, we're transmitting across that range of frequencies. And then channel 2. Center is 2417. I'll omit the units. So the minimum, same bandwidth, all channels use the same bandwidth, is minus 11 is 2406. And it goes up to a maximum frequency of 2428 megahertz. So channel 2, we transmit across this range of frequencies. Note that they overlap. In channel 1, we're transmitting at 2401. Of course, transmitting 2000 includes 2406, 4007 and so on. So we transmit on channel 1, we're transmitting on the sum of the same, same frequency components as on channel 2. Not all, but some. That is, they overlap. And that's what this diagram shows. If this is channel 1, from 2401 up to 2423, channel 2 overlaps in a portion of the spectrum there. And if we overlap, if we transmit on channel 1 and channel 2 at the same time, two different devices, and because the overlap in this portion of the spectrum, they can interfere at a receiver. And that's a problem. And when we say if two transmit at the same time and cause interference at the receiver, we'll assume the receiver cannot understand or receive anything. So using overlapping channels is no better normally than using the same channel. I have a laptop transmitting on channel 1 and another device tr transmitting on channel 1. Then they can potentially interfere with each other when they transmit. If I have a laptop on channel 1 and another device on channel 2, they can also potentially interfere with each other. And we get, or we're going to assume that we get approximately the same performance from using the same channel compared to using two channels that overlap with each other. the same if we use channel 1 then I transmit on channel 1 and receive on channel 1. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's, it depends on the modulation technique but it, well you know it's a spread spectrum it uses the, the entire width. It uses this, the, it use, transmits on all of them. No, we've, we've said that every, every station, well, you transmit on channel 1 and you receive on channel 1. Uh, and of course, we've already said you can only transmit or receive. You cannot transmit and receive at the same time. So yes, if I'm transmitting on channel 1 and this has a wireless device, it will not be receiving on channel 1. If it tries to, if I'm transmitting to the access point, there'll be a problem or interference. So what we'll see when we look at the medium access control is the aim is that only one transmits at a time so that we don't interfere. And why, we, why don't we use the frequency for uh, We can only, you mean a device, but a device still can only transmit or receive if it used transmit on one frequency, receive on another, it doesn't benefit much because it can only transmit or receive. 
So changing frequency is as an additional complexity in the implementation. So use the same frequency gives the same performance. We look at the subsequent channels, one, two, three, four, and we do the same analysis, we'll see that the, from channel one, giving the channel that does not overlap, we see channel five overlaps slightly, the channel that doesn't overlap is channel six. What that means is if my laptop transmits on channel one to some other device, the PC transmits on channel six to some other destination, then they will not interfere at the receiver because they're transmitting on separate channels using a portion of the spectrum that does not interfere with each other, it does not overlap on different frequencies. So that's possible and it gives us an advantage in setting up a network in that that allows two to transmit at the same time, effectively doubling the speed at which we can transfer data. This one's transmitting and this one's transmitting means overall we've got two transmitting at the same time. So having non-overlapping channels will allow multiple parallel transmissions between different devices, not with the same device, but between different devices. That is, these two communicate on channel one, at the same time these two tr communicate on channel six, and these two communicate on channel 11 if he was awake. So we have three non-overlapping channels allowing three pairs to communicate at the same time. If these two use channel one, these two use channel one, and these two use, they also use channel one, then we must share that spectrum and the transmission times amongst the, the three pairs of users. That's why we care about non-overlapping channels, not really about the number of channels in total. There are three non-overlapping channels available here out of the 13 normally available. Uh, what's my device using? That's the frequency of my device, uh, the channels available because in different countries and different devices support different portions of the spectrum because the, the, the regulations it may differ as to what channels are supported. I think I can list them. The channels on my device that are supported, there are 13 channels supported from 1 to 13. The current one in use is channel 6. Normally in practice, the access point will be configured to use one channel <coughs> and the client, when it tries to find an access point, will search across multiple channels and see if there are any access points on any of those channels and then choose one of them, choose the channel of the access point it wants to associate with. So if I reconnect to another access point, I may be using a different channel on my laptop. So in summary about the physical layer, we've seen some of the characteristics, the, the data rates, the frequencies being used. We're going to assume from now on that we're going to have a, a device has some transmission range. Anyone within the range can receive the signal. If you're outside of the range, you cannot. Uh, we'll assume that we have half duplex communications. We can only transmit or receive. We cannot do both at the same time from a device's perspective and we'll assume that if two or more stations transmit at the same time and are within range of the receiver, that receiver cannot understand either of those transmissions. It cannot re successfully receive either. And what we'll go through now is the MAC layer 
and how to control access to the medium. And there are two main parts of the MAC layer. How to manage your connections with the access point and how to transfer data. Today we'll just start on the management procedures. The data transfer happens after we establish some connection or association. Where's my pointer? So the MAC procedures. Physical layer provides a means for sending data across the wireless link. The MAC defines ways for managing the network, which means discovering access points, joining with an access point so you can use it, and leaving the access point or the basic server set or extended server set. That is, when you turn on your laptop, how does it know that there's an access point nearby? And then how does it connect with that access point? The MAC layer also defines ways for transmitting our data in some efficient and robust manner. How do we share access with surrounding laptops, for example, if we all want to transmit across the same or to the same access point? Who gets to transmit and when? The MAC layer is common across the different physical layers. Though it doesn't matter if I'm using 11B or 11G or 11N, the principles are the same. Some of the parameter values differ, but the principles are the same. And the MAC layer uses a hardware or a MAC address, or this IEEE 48-bit address that we use for Ethernet, used for both clients and access points. Let's look what the management procedures need to do. I turn on my laptop. I want to connect to the SIT wireless LAN. How does my laptop know that there are access points nearby? That's the first thing that we need to solve. How do we discover access points? Two approaches are used, or can be used. One approach is the access points periodically send special messages. The messages we refer to in wireless LAN are we refer to as frames. And in this case, it periodically broadcasts a beacon frame. It's an advertisement. The access point, when it's on and running, maybe every 100 milliseconds, sends this special beacon frame saying, I am an access point. You can connect to me. That's the idea. So it advertises itself to anyone within range. The access points are always on. So when I turn on my laptop, I start listening. If I receive a beacon from an access point, I've discovered an access point. If I receive beacons from 10 access points, I've discovered 10 access points. So that's the first way. Any client that receives a beacon knows that AP exists and then can choose which one to use. The other way is that when I turn on my client, I can be proactive and go in search for an access point. And there's a special frame called a probe request. I do a probe for an access point. I send this probe request. I broadcast it to everyone within range. If an access point receives a probe request frame, it may respond with a probe response saying, I am an access point. So the idea, I turn on my laptop. I transmit a probe request. I broadcast it, means I'm trying to transmit to everyone. If an access point receives it, it may respond with a response, and then I know about that access point. So that's the discovery procedures we have available. A, a passive approach, where the client is passive, it just sits there and waits for a beacon, and an active or proactive approach where the, the client is active and it initiates the discovery. In both cases, we need to choose, uh, we need to use multiple, or usually we would check multiple channels. Because I turn on my laptop, if the access point out in the corridor is configured to use channel 6, my laptop doesn't know that. 
There are 13 channels that my laptop supports. Which channel do I listen on? I can only receive on one channel at a time. So what would normally happen is that my laptop in this discovery process will listen for a short time on channel one, say for uh, 10 milliseconds, then switch to channel two and listen on that for 10 milliseconds. Do I see, receive a beacon? If yes, I've discovered an access point. If not, move on, try channel three. So swap between the channels, listening for beacons on each of the channels, do that for some period of time, and then I should have discovered hopefully more than one or one or more access points, possibly on different channels, and then I need to do, make the decision which access point I want to connect to. Like check the access point with a stronger signal and then choose that access point. Same with the probe request. We may send a probe request on multiple channels. Send it on channel one, wait for a response, send it on channel two, wait for a response and so on. So that's part of the discovery phase. Once I know about an access point, I associate with an access point. And there are two steps really. Authentication and association. Authentication is to check whether I'm allowed to use the network. And if I'm successful there, register with that access point, register with the network. So authentication and then association. And the basic, or the procedures in both of them are simple in that I send a request, an authentication request to the access point, the access point sends back a reply or response. If everything's okay, they'll say successful, you're authenticated. Then I send an association request and the access point sends back a response saying you're registered on the network. Once my client is associated with an access point, I can ex with, we can exchange data in both directions. If I turn off my client, what happens? Either the client or the access point can deauthenticate or disassociate. Can stop the data transfer. And there's even a special reassociation procedure. I'm associated with access point one, I'm moving. Access point two is better, it gives better signal. I'll reassociate from access point one to access point two. Register with a new one. So there are ways to do that. Let's finish with an example to illustrate that, if possible, quickly. Remember, I have two, two wireless LAN devices in my laptop, the inbuilt one and the second one. Uh, let's disconnect from the inbuilt one. I'm turning off my wireless, wireless LAN zero device, that is the laptop inbuilt wireless LAN device. Turn it down or turn it off. And now, what I'm going to do is use the second device to capture some packets. The idea is that what I want to demonstrate is the packets that are, or the frames which are sent to uh, discover, join and authenticate with a network. So I'm going to use my inbuilt wireless LAN device to discover and associate with an access point and at the same time use my second wireless LAN device to capture all those frames so we can see them in some software. We'll see this in other demonstrations but let's do it quickly if I can remember. Do it quickly in the last five minutes. My second wireless LAN device is WLAN 1. I'm going to turn it off. Turn it down. And now I'm going to turn it so that it will monitor what everyone else sends.
I'm going to turn it into a mode so that it will monitor what others are sending, so I can see what others are sending. And turn it up again. Turn it on now. And now I'm going to use TCP dump to capture packets of size 1000 bytes and save them in a file. It's capturing packets, that is this device Anything that anyone else is sending across the wireless network, this one should be taking a copy of right now, capturing those packets. Now, so it's doing that. Now I'll go back to the wireless device in my laptop. I'm going to try and connect to the access point. So I'll turn it on. Let's look at the status. And now I'll, so currently my laptop is not associated with anything. So let's now connect to the WSIT. Network. Sorry, I need permissions. I connected to the WSIT network. So I'm now associated with, with an access point. This is the identity of one of the access points with extended service set ID WSIT. Now if everything worked correctly, coming back to my second wireless device, I should have captured the messages which were sent there actually captured 76,000 different packets. Some of them should be the wireless packets which were sent but by my laptop to the access point. Let's open that file. File 1. It's 15 megabytes because I captured what, not only what my laptop was sending, but what all your mobile phones were sending if they were switched on their wireless LAN and what everyone else was sending out in other rooms as well. We'll quickly have a look and see if we can see some things we recognize. Here we are. Let's quickly find a packet that may be recognizable. try and find the wireless LAN frames which were sent of those. There were 76,000. Some of them hopefully were wireless LAN frames. And we see here's one. It's a beacon frame. This is a summary information that this time this device with the MAC address 0002 sent to this special address, the all F's address means a broadcast. That is, there's an access point somewhere identified by this address that was broadcasted, that broadcasted a beacon frame. So anyone within range, including my laptop and including the, the external card, received that beacon frame and learnt about that access point. So that's the process of discovery. 
And we see that there are many of these beacon frames from different, access, different sources, different access points. There are two different ones here. Actually three. 4C, B0, 6D. So there are three access points somewhere sending beacon frames. For example, sending 10 per second. And they just keep sending them. And when I receive them, ah, some are probe responses. So some are different types of messages where someone has sent a probe request and the access point has responded with a probe response. That's about all we have time for today. We'll look at more details of exactly the, ex the exchange of those packets and look at more of these examples of the, the packet capture next week and continue on wireless lands.